lovely. Thank you, first of all, for, for all of you coming here to, to this afternoon to, to come and see us as well, because everything in America is long distance. So there's no kind of nip around the corner for 10 minutes. So it's, uh, I greatly appreciate that. Um, and we're honored to be here. We've had a, we arrived here last night. Um, it's an amazing city, amazing area, and, um, we're, and we're loving it. And um, loving the, the fact that uh, obviously a, part of, a big sort of percentage of our watches are uh, made for military folk of which there are a lot here tonight as well. So we've had some very fascinating stories already. Um, yeah, we're, we're on a bit of a, a little bit of a tour on the, on the East Coast, um, mainly to because we've had a launch of three new watches. Um, but the exciting thing, these three watches have come from this new facility, which we finished building about three years ago. So if, if any of you are ever in the UK in the coming you know, years or months, or whatever, we're about half an hour from, uh, from Heathrow and you'll come there. There's a 35,000 square foot um, watchmaking facility which we've spent the last sort of 20 years working towards. And what's quite exciting about that facility is you've, you've got case manufacture, you've got movement manufacture there. Your Bremont manufactures its own sort of ENG 300 movement now series, which is incredibly exciting. Um, you've got the design, you've got everything else that goes into it as well. Um, the story for Bremont, which I know a lot of you know too well, um, but just very briefly, my you know, brother and I set the business up about 20 years ago. Our background was a lot of aviation predominantly, love of making all things, I love all things mechanical, making things in the workshop, spent a lot of time with our father who is an aeronautical engineer. Um, he also loved uh, flying, um, so the mostly uh, air show flying and old aircraft and display flying rather, and Giles and I were lucky enough to get into that, um, which we, you know, we did for uh, for quite a few years, and then I, long story short, I had a nasty accident with my father in 1995, um, which he 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 didn't. He, he passed away and, and I broke a lot of bones and for Giles and I that was a bit of a tipping point in our life and we just said look actually throw, let's throw caution to the wind slightly and go off and do something we want to do. To begin with that was restoring historic aircraft and then we had another business between that and Bremer. Um and the reason Bremer came about was basically because we'd sit in the workshop as I said from a young age as a sort of cheap form of childcare from our mother being thrown in <laughs> um, and we would tinker with things. We, you know, we're Restored old airplanes, uh, cars. Uh, we restored actually one of the last trips we did here to see Steve and Linda was in an old car that we drove, ended up driving across America, which is an old E type, and, and, and that was something our father had restored from my mother 40 years ago. And we remembered that very, very well. And, but one of the things he was passionate about were clocks and watches. And so we would sit there talking about, you know, the clocks, our, grand, our, our grandfather, not a grandfather clock, but our grandfather was very much into clocks as well. So he'd come in and we'd chat about them. And he, you know, I've still got my, for example, my father's old, uh, you know, Mark 10 IWC from the 1940s, which I just love, you know. Charles has got his old Breitling Navitimer that he would, you know, he won an RAF competition, all three of us was sponsored through the Air Force. So this sort of connection between watches and time and flying was always ever present. And um, <clears throat> But one thing you'd talk about, which is really quite special, was this history of British watchmaking. You know, everyone talks about Swiss, and quite rightly so, they've done some amazing stuff over the last you know, 100, 200 years. But before that, you know, 50% of the world's clocks and watches came from British shores. Half the innovation in any mechanical watch still comes from the UK. Um, so there is this history there. You know, the world set at time by Greenwich, for, and it still does. Um, and that's because the first ship's chronometers this whole conundrum of telling the time at sea um, and the fact that the, the British Navy, which are pretty diminished now, let's face it, but they were quite, quite powerful back in their day. And the reason for that was because they, they, they sussed out how to tell the, the time at sea and this conundrum of, of longitude and therefore navigation. Um, but then there's two world wars, you know, and then there's the courts revolution, all these sort of things, and Britain gradually lost, you know, it's all about the war effort in so many cases, not about making watches. 
And, and so the mission for Bremont very much about has been bringing, you know, from the last 20 years, as much watchmaking back as we can. So we started off, Giles and I, we trundled off to Switzerland and Bien, and we, we just saw if we could, you know, what, what would it take to make a watch? And we realized that the whole industry in Switzerland was very horizontally integrated. You know, had some making dials, some making hands, some making movements, some making cases, and the brand would be in the middle orchestrating. And Giles went, and I went out there and it was, it was tough you know first of all we told our wives it'd take a year and a half to make a first watch it ended up taking us five um, so we sheepishly go off to work and was still no, no nothing to show for it really um, but gradually we learned more and more and more and uh, after the first well two years where these the watches originally made in Switzerland we brought that back. So we, the first, you know, two years, we had our own watchmakers in Switzerland, in BN, um, and we needed to have the the, the know-how over there. But gradually, we brought that back. And as I said, the last 20 years, it's been about increasing the, I suppose, the the apprenticeships, the training, the the the, the machinery, and everything else that goes with watchmaking. And it's been a real journey. So um, we started off with assembly. Then we started off with. Then we moved on to uh, servicing. This is about 15 years ago. They went to case manufacture. Um, then we went finally into movement manufacture. But the, the big part of this was controlling the IP, the intellectual property. It was, you know, so you're a you're an engineering company. That's actually watches, I have to say, there are more simple industries. I think defense is probably one of the few that's more complex, but it's not an easy industry because you've got you're you're an engineering company, you know, we're doing every one of our own drawings. Um, and that's key. You know, you can think you own your own drawings, but until you've actually drawn them yourself, you don't. And we, we you know, it took us a while to understand that. Um, you you're a manufacturing company, well it's also an engineering company in respect that you're cutting metal, you know, you're, you've got these guys sending the drawings from one part of the building to the chaps that are running these amazing machines, you know, these five, six, up to 11 axis different CNC mill turning machines, you know, machining to, I was just telling a chap earlier, you know, you're a human hair is 60 to 100 microns, you're, you're machining to two microns on the movements. Um, so it's incredibly small torrances. And again, you know, you have to train the person up not only to be able to run the machine, but they've got to be able to program the machine. They've got to be able to make changes if needs be. So you're, so you're this, you're a pretty hardcore engineering company. Um, but then you're also a manufacturing company. So you've got, you know, our movement, for example. There's 61 different sub-assemblies. We probably make about 60% of the movement in Henley. Um, but you're still reliant on some outsourcing of, you know, hair springs or, you know, silicon escapements or whatever we're using. It still has to come from other suppliers. And But once you get those parts, you're gluing parts. You know, if you see the way the, the balance springs glued into the escapement, I mean, it's a, it's a massive operation. It's incredible to watch it happen on these huge magnifying glasses. You're setting jewels. You're finishing the movement parts. You're doing all these things, as I said, yeah, 61 different sub-assemblies for the movement. Then you're putting this movement together, you're regulating it, you're testing it, you're doing our own chromatic testing in the UK, first time since the, um, I think it was the, um, Oh, Q testing in the late 60s, which was done. Um, you'll see some of the Rolexes and Amigas were, were done there. And that's probably the last chronometer testing until now. So we, again, where do you get chronometer testing done in the UK? You can't unless you do it yourself. So we had to set up this whole system, uh, sort of laboratory to do that, which was, again, exciting, but work. Um, so you're, you got to the manufacturing bit, and then you're a retailer. You know, you're working with ret amazing retailers, and then you, you can have the best brand in the world. And if you, if you don't, you know, know about you, then uh, you're as good as, you're as good as nothing. So you, you're you're spending a whole lot of time marketing as well, and it's a, it's quite exhausting business. And you're, you've 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 you learned about it both of you as we've gone along as well. It's um, but it's exciting. Every day's different, and uh, you know, we've met some incredible people along the way. And the 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 sort of three pillars of the brand, and we kept it three, so my brother would understand. Um, <laughs> was one one was this British, you know, the engineering aspect of it, the fact that we were doing it in, in a country, and that made it quite a big differentiator. I mean, there's probably 10, 15 companies in the world where you can go and see as much one watchmaking under one roof as you can in Henley now. So this is why if you're ever heading that way, please do, because so many things are outsourced. That's the way an industry works. If you're a 
watch brand, very few watch brands make their own cases, very few watch brands make their own movements, very few watch brands assemble. It's all outsourced. Mm -hmm. So if you want to come and see this happen, it's, it's quite fun. Um, so the British, and we've, through that, we've worked with some amazing British, um, I suppose, partnerships. So Martin Baker, we've had a lot of Martin Baker stories tonight. We've got an ejectee over there who's actually pulled the handle and survived, which is an incredible story in an F4 Phantom. Um, and we were, and that was fascinating because it was a it was a relationship based on environmental testing. So you know we can test things in the laboratory, but they've got the incredible facility to go out there. Actually, we want to do you know 40 years worth of shot testing or climatic testing or salt fog testing. And we've just done a big program which we'll show you there for the um, uh, for with, on the F35 and the um, the new F16 replacement seat program, which has been quite exciting because it gives us this opportunity to do these tests which would never do ourselves and that relationship's gone on for nearly 20 years um, and we're a lovely lovely partnership there um, at Rolls-Royce Aerospace you know Jaguar Cars uh, Williams F1 which we'll get on to in a minute we've got these lovely partnerships which we're incredibly proud of most of them have a British focus only because we're over there um, but I'm sure you'll hear more coming in over on this side of the Atlantic as well the second one was this aviation military bit, our background's obviously there, and the military side is something we're incredibly proud of. So if you come to Henley, you can see badges of you know, several hundred of these squadrons, which have been, and, and military units and government agencies, which have been done over Bremont the last 20 years. And um, they're great because you meet so many wonderful people through that. Um, and then the third one was adventure. So the whole idea was when Giles and I started, we had our first prototype watch, and we went, this is great. You know, you're looking at your watch and it is your first little baby and you think this is really, really quite special. Um, but you're thinking, yeah, but Nick, do you think it's going to last if I go and do this with it? Or do you? And you just don't know because you, you haven't experienced the whole testing side. So you've built a beautiful watch and you're going, this is brilliant. But you know, if I go windsurfing with it, do you, do you think it'll work? And I, yeah, we've tested it waterproof. Yeah, but do you think, there's all these do you thinks. So the, quite early on, we said, look, the best thing to do is just strap it, strap them to a few crazy people doing crazy things so like Baird off you know here's a mate and he went off and used it for the first few years and then you had Ewan McGregor and Charlie Bourne on their motorcycles on the long way down sort of four months of vibration on a motorcycle was brilliant testing we had Jake who's just come back from climbing you know Everest again he is you know climbing K2 he did the seven summits by the time he's 21 you know he's and we just had all these people doing it crazy crazy things so by the time we'd done that and we'd just launched and people say, yeah, but, you know, will it, can I go windsurfing? And we go, yeah, well, actually. And we could tell them exactly what the watch had been through. And that gave us a huge amount of confidence. And because we'd worked with these amazing people, we started attracting more and more amazing people. So over the years, for example, Kristen at the moment climbing the 14 summits that like we did have. We sponsored NIMS beforehand doing his. Um, you've probably seen it on Netflix. But Kristen is, is unbelievable. She's just done 12 of the 14, all without oxygen. Um, and she did them last year as well, mm -hmm. but she couldn't get permission to do the China bit because of the, end, you know, the tail end of COVID. But uh, she's amazing. You've got Ben Saunders, who incredible polar explorers. You've got people like Aldo and Jason Fox. I mean, there's some amazing people doing amazing things. So, uh, yeah, so that's the bit of the testing bit. Those are our sort of three pillars. But in terms of the watches today, um, I'd just like to talk to you briefly because they're, 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 they all have quite fun stories behind them. Um, can we play this first video? Um, and we designed this jig. It was made out of, originally made out of carbon fiber, mm -hmm. and we screwed it into cockpits, we screwed it into um, vibration testing rigs, um, and then we ended up designing a, a sort of a fairly 
crude at the time uh, case that could be strapped to the to the ejection seat um, uh, mannequin you just saw there. Then over time we more and more comments kept coming back. This is actually quite a funky looking watch, this. And it was incredibly light um, because it's made of carbon fiber. And it, was, and it was very different looking. They wanted to keep the orange because if the strap broke, they could find it in the field and all that sort of thing. So we ended up saying, actually, let's do it as a, as a, a one-off. It's called the Viper because it's been tested on the F-16 program um, through Martin Baker. and. Uh, it just, it just sort of worked. So we designed this watch. In the end, we machined it out of titanium, um, Henley. Um, it's got the allium and anodized ring as well. You've got all of the anti-shock mechanism where the movement ties into. Um, and it's just a very funky watch. So we did a limited edition. That, and it's something you've got to, if you haven't tried, pick it up, pick it up, because it is so light. Um, and it's a really lovely watch to wear. And it's so, so different from anything we've done before. So we had a lot of fun doing that. But for us, what was really exciting is that the movement at the end passed flying colors, which was a massive relief for us all around, um, because it meant we can then use that movement in the Martin Baker range moving forward if we ever wanted to. So, so that was that watch. Um, the other two watches, which is, the first was a partnership watch, which we'd worked with for a number of years. And that's Jaguar. And we've worked with uh, Jaguar Land Rover for probably 12 years or something now, quite a number of years. And again, British manufacturer. Um, we had done a lot with Ian Callum, the chief designer of Jaguar. Um, if you go and you look at, uh, Ian, he was at Aston Martin before that, where he designed the DB9, the DB7, the Vanquish, and things like that. And he came to Jaguar and designed the F-Type and F-Pace, and now he's doing a lot of other cool stuff. <clears throat> and um, we ended up designing watches that went into the Royal Jaguars, uh, watches that, uh, clocks that went into Royal Jaguars really, clocks that went into some of the Aston Martin prototypes they'd done and some other cool cars. Um, but we also focused on a lot of the historic Jaguar racing heritage. So we'd done an E-type watch, a D-type watch. Um, but one watch we hadn't done um, was the C-type. And it's, uh, it's a rather special machine. Um, I think let's play this video and then it sort of tells a little bit of the story. Only two weeks after the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II in June 1953, a Jaguar C-Type brought the real feel-good factor to Britain by winning the Le Mans. Arguably the most grueling and arduous race in motorsport, 1953 proved to be one of the most memorable races in its history. The car's drivers were true British heroes who lived and raced with an unabashed exuberance. As well as its innovative engineering and design, the C-Type XKC051 also produced formidable results, recording the first 100 mile an hour average speed at the mall. In tribute to this feat, and in its 70th anniversary year, Bremont presents the new Jaguar C-Type. So this is quite a fun watch and the back was quite a special one to do this so we it was the you know the jaguar lovely badge pressed on the bonnet of the c-type uh brass and enamel um uh, sort of pressed pressed uh, case back which we had a lot of fun doing you've got the tachymeter um but if you're into motorsport it's a very motorsport vintage looking watch but it's uh, a lot of fun to to make um and then the third one um, which uh, again has been a, a great fun partnership. I don't know if any of you boys and girls are into Formula One. Yeah. I've always been to, I, I mean, it's coming to America, isn't it? I mean, it's getting bigger and bigger in America, I think, thanks to Netflix, but it's, um, it's always been a big passion, especially in Europe and the rest of the world. Um, and uh, Williams is one of the most successful teams, one of the two most successful teams ever to have raced. I think they've had 200, no, was it 244 podium, podiums where they've had one or two more drivers on it. So they've been incredibly successful. Um, does this have any music?
What's lovely about Williams, they're, they're another Oxfordshire based company, which is where Bremont are based. Um, and uh, they are, you know, they've got this illustrious history and they're an incredibly lovely company to work with. Um, they've got, they're not doing, they've got a bit of work to do in the, in the, in the, the rankings at the moment, which they'd be the first to admit, but they've got such an exciting sort of curve ahead. Um, if you ever go to their Grove manufacturing uh, testing facility, you'll see this unbelievable sort of history of motorsport with all of the cars that like Ayrton Senna, Nigel Mansell, all these amazing, um, uh, Kiki Rosberg, all these amazing drivers over the years have driven. Um, and we've done, this is I think the third watch we've done with them. And it's, uh, it's a motorsport chronograph, again, with the, the tachometer. You've got the, um, the brilliant uh, sort of open sapphire back with the, um, the Williams rotor. But it's, uh, we did this kind of retro uh, sort of looking hand selection on it. Um, and it's, you know, the drivers are wearing it. It's been out there for, for a month or so. Um, and it's something which has um, gone down incredibly well. But if you would like to pick it up, come and have a look, have a play with them, um, and uh, hopefully you can see what, sort of uh, what we like in the, in the watches as well.